Hello and welcome to week four. This is our whole week on Pompeii. So I'm really excited to be sharing this with you. This is one of my favorite topics to talk about. And it's because, you know, the last few weeks we've been looking at emperors, we've been looking at a lot of political history, things that were really centered in the heart of Rome as the city. But this week we're going to be looking at the people. So we're going to be looking at daily life, how people lived and uh, worshipped and ate and drank and socialized, all of these different things. And we're going to do that by looking at the best preserved Roman city that we have, which is Pompeii. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the eruption. We're going to talk about the general city layout. And we're also going to be talking about the public buildings, a lot of which are hallmarks of Roman architecture, of Roman urban life. So these are things that we'll see in pretty much all Roman cities, especially as we start moving out to the provinces, as new colonies are, are incorporated into the Roman Empire. These are things that you see everywhere. It sort of marks it as a Roman city if it has these things. So, and then on Thursday, we will be looking more at uh, houses and uh, more artworks. So this is going to be kind of architecture heavy and kind of archaeology heavy also. And then on Thursday, we'll get back to the art. So I want to start with some geography, right? So situating you here, uh, we are in sort of southern Italy. So again, right by Naples, if you've ever been to Italy, if you've visited Naples, very close by, maybe some of you have even been to Pompeii. So if we have Rome here, sort of in the central coast, uh, Pompeii is more toward the south. Um, and it's it's part of those those groups of Greek colonies, right? So some of these names might look familiar from when I showed you that that map of the Greek colonies a few weeks ago. Um, so in southern Italy, um, a little bit of history for you. You don't have to know all of this super well, but I do kind of want to situate where we are and how we got to this point. So uh, Pompeii was founded by the Oscans, which is an Italic tribe. So uh, an Italic group of people founded the city around the eighth century or so, similar to when Rome was founded. Um, but it kind of turned into a Greek colony because all of these Greek immigrants came and set up their own settlements in uh, southern Italy. And so they start taking over the area. And so, so many people start moving in. The state starts taking on more of a Greek character. Um, in around 290, which is similar to when Paestum was conquered, uh, uh, Pompeii was also conquered by the Romans. Uh, it became an allied state. So that's important because it was not one of those settlements that received a citizenship, uh, a high citizenship package, right? So we talked a little bit about how there were different levels of citizenship packages kind of depending on how warmly you welcomed the Romans, right? Um, and Pompeii did not get a great one along with many others. Um, they didn't receive citizenship right away. Uh, fast forward to around 91 BC and these, these issues of uh, representation of citizenship have boiled to the surface and uh, breaks out in something called the social war, which was essentially all of these cities who were allied states, all of these uh, kind of independent communities, but they were under the Roman Empire um, in, uh, in Italy. They engage in the social war, which is kind of a revolution in a way. It was them wanting citizenship status, wanting more rights, wanting to be more incorporated into the Roman Republic. And um, it's ultimately a successful revolution, uh, re revolt, whatever you wanna call it. Um, and so Pompeii receives Roman citizenship status in 80 BC. And that's important because at that time we start seeing a lot more Roman urban forms entering the city. So new construction, things that look a lot more Roman because they are much more incorporated into the, the Roman world at that point. Uh, fast forward again, so uh, 79 CE, that is when the eruption takes place, uh, perhaps 20,000 people live there, making it kind of a mid-level town, so not a huge city, but definitely not a village either, sort of somewhere in, the, in between. Um, and it wasn't really a um, politically significant town. It was more of a vacation getaway, right? So <laughs> it was on the southern coast, it was on the water, and we see a lot of villas nearby of, of people who were living in Rome, who were senators, who were aristocrats, and they would have these villas around Pompeii in the Bay of Naples, and they would come and relax and vacation on the beach, right? And so uh, Pompeii was sort of a city that served those interests. Um, it did have some industry of its own, but it also was kind of a vacation town. And uh, something else important to note in its history, 
is that in 62 CE, so the eruption is in 79 CE, in 62 CE, um, Pompeii suffers a fairly serious earthquake. And this is important uh, for multiple reasons. First of all, for the fact that it probably uh, was hinting at the fact that a eruption is coming, right? So um, sometimes earthquakes happen and then a few days later, you know, volcanoes erupt. This, in this case, it was years later, but still um, uh, evidence of, of sort of, uh, that kind of, th those kinds of phenomenons going on, right? Um, another part though, for us as art historians or archeologists, uh, people studying Pompeii, is that it means that a lot of uh, buildings and things in the city were rebuilt because they were damaged in that earthquake. So when they were damaged, the people in the city rebuilt them. And so it's interesting because we can uh, really pinpoint when something was built or um, certain artistic styles, architectural styles, because we almost know for a lot of them, they were either built between 62 CE and, and 79 CE. And that is, uh, you know, to have that, um, that range of that short range of time when we're looking at, at something so long ago is really important because we can really um, specialize in that and really look at what was going on in that exact time period. You know, it's not that it was built sometime in the second century, you know, or something like that. We see with some of the artworks we've looked at where we know general dates. Um, the fact that there was this earthquake and then things were rebuilt means that we have a more specific uh, time range. Uh, so Mount Vesuvius, right? So we'll start with the eruption since I know that's kind of <laughs> what everyone wants to hear about probably right off the bat. Um, so here's Mount Vesuvius. Um, you can see it uh, from the Forum of Pompeii, that big mountain that uh, emerges in the distance. You can also see it from Naples, right? So it's all on this bay, all of these, these cities. Um, it's, it is an active volcano. So its last eruption was in 1944. Um, it, a couple of, uh, if you're a, a STEM major, <laughs> you'll enjoy this part of the lecture, I suppose. Um, so it is a, not a, um, a shield volcano. So a shield volcano is like Hawaii, right? Where there's lava flows, it, creates this new rock, it can form islands, things like that. Um, Vesuvius is not one of those volcanoes. The important thing to know about the type of volcano that Vesuvius is, is that its eruptions spew uh, ash and uh, gas and rock, um, not lava. So it's much more um, uh, kind of rocky, I suppose, when it erupts rather than like molten lava. And that's important also because that means that Pompeii was preserved. So if it had been a volcano like Hawaii, where there were lava flows, um, the whole city would have just been incinerated. But because we have this, this more rocky, ashy, uh, gas-like eruption, that means that it uh, blanketed the city and just covered it and almost uh, uh, suffocated it. And that preserved it. So the fact that, uh, this volcano is that type of volcano is very important because that's why we have Pompeii today. Um, that's why it was not burned down. That's why it was sort of preserved under this rock. Um, so the eruption. We mainly know about the eruption from a primary eyewitness account from someone called Pliny the Younger. So he is called Pliny the Younger because there was also a Pliny the Elder who was his uncle. Um, both of them were authors. Uh, Pliny the Elder maybe even a bit more well known. Um, he wrote a very famous book called Natural History. Um, and so if you take any classics courses, you might encounter Pliny the Elder for that reason. Uh, but Pliny the Elder, uh, at the time of the eruption in 79, was a military officer. He was serving in, uh, in that area in Naples. And uh, when we start to hear that there are, there's an eruption happening, um, he gets word from friends in Pompeii that uh, they're trapped. And being the good man that he is, according to his nephew, he went off and tried to rescue them, but unfortunately was unsuccessful and ended up dying in Pompeii. So uh, this whole story that we get um, is from Pliny the Younger who narrates this entire account from when they first start to realize that something is wrong to Pliny the Elder leaving and then to Pliny the Younger and his mother's escape. Um, and they do that both of them do make it out alive. So um, that's where we kind of get our, our primary uh, source from. That's how we know what happened in the eruption. Um, but also a lot of scientists have done work on trying to figure out exactly the chain of events and how this all happened as well. 
So um, I do want to go through the eruption. <laughs> if you don't know every detail, that's okay. Um, I'm not a scientist, so I will forgive you if you don't know it. Um, but yeah, so there's two phases of the uh, Vesuvian eruption. Um, and the first is called the Plinian phase, named for uh, Pliny the Younger, talked about it. So the first phase is what you see in that bottom left corner uh, where it spews this giant column of, as I said earlier, gas and ash and rock and it creates this giant cloud in the sky. And the way that Pliny talks about it is that he uh, likens it to this type of pine tree, this umbrella pine tree uh, that was found in Italy in around Naples uh, grows there. And in his account, he compares the, the column, the cloud to these trees. Um, and also if we look at other eruptions, um, Mount St. Helens is also a similar volcano. And so um, we see this, this same sort of, of cloud or column that erupts in of the sky. Um, so yes, not lava, um, but gas and ash and because and rock. And so because of that, it, it would rain rock down. And so this starts happening. Um, and, uh, you know, Pliny talks about noticing that first. And that's when, you know, people <laughs> start realizing something is wrong. And so a lot of people uh, evacuate the city at this point because um, they see the giant cloud, which is very frightening, I would assume. And uh, rock begins to rain down and build up and he talks about uh, trying to leave the city and then seeing this buildup of rock. Um, and so uh, unfortunately though, it did trap some people inside the city. Um, it may have uh, blocked their doorways, things like that where they couldn't escape. So that's very unfortunate, um, but that lasted nearly a day. So there were a lot of people who did escape because um, they, they, you know, it started raining <laughs> essentially on them um, and they decided to get out of the city. Um, there were also some earthquakes. Uh, Pliny also talks about earthquakes that happened around that time. So that's the first one, this giant column of, of cloud-like substance. Um, and the second one is the pyroclastic flow. And that is really what was fatal in the Vesuvian eruption. So when the column uh, builds and builds and builds up into the sky, unfortunately, it has to collapse at some point. And when it collapses, all of that stuff that's up in the atmosphere uh, falls to earth so quickly um, that it's almost like a, a wave of gas that, that, that moves through the land. Um, and so that is what ended up killing the people who died in the eruption. Um, they essentially died of, of suffocation because when this gas comes through, it asphyxiates you so quickly. Um, and it's a very instant death. So uh, there was really no escaping at that point. If you were not out of the city, um, when the pyroclastic flow hit, probably did not survive. Um, and it was also, it's also a very, very hot gas. And so uh, it could have also uh, been, uh, you, you know, you can't survive in that type of heat either. Um, but scientists have looked at it and it, uh, victims and, uh, you know, uh, uh, evidence that we have, and it seems that the common uh, f factor of death was actually suffocation because of this gas that came through and cuts off all the oxygen for you. Um, so uh, that means, uh, as I said, um, it's a very quick death. And so we see a lot of, uh, of um, bodies that archaeologists found. And so here's, here's, I want to talk a little bit about this because there are some common misconceptions here. Um, and so these are not bodies. <laughs> if you haven't been to Pompeii, um, you might not know that. These are not bodies. So what happened is um, when the pyroclastic flow came through, people were asphyxiated um, and died essentially right where they were when that flow came through. Um, so a lot of times that was, you know, in their home or on the street, wherever they might have been. Um, what happens is then is that you know, their body is there. Um, and this, there's the continuing raining of ash and rock um, and everything. And that just, as I said, was building up and building up and it continued to build up. There was this ash fall that went on for multiple days probably um, that just completely blankets the city. Um, and that is why Pompeii was buried for so long, for centuries and centuries, right? Is because it was buried under this ash that then hardened and turned to rock. But what happened was when there were bodies um, the ash fell on them and around their body, right? But over time, bodies decay. So when the bodies would decay, uh, because there was this ash around them that had hardened into rock, essentially, their bodies decayed and you were left with a cavity in the rock that was exactly the shape that the body had been in. 
So when archaeologists were excavating, um, you know, really early on in the 1700s, um, they started finding these weird cavities in the rock. They would be excavating the ground um, and find a weird cavity and, and people started to theorize about this. And what they did is they poured plaster into these cavities and they found that their idea of what it was was correct, that this is where someone's body had been but had now decayed and there was nothing, nothing left of their natural body. So that's what we get here. These are all plaster casts of bodies. Um, and you can see that because it was such a quick death, um, they didn't even have time to move or react really. And so we get these, these interesting positions that they were in. Um, and we see facial expressions, you know, in the really uh, detailed plaster casts that they have. Um, sometimes we even get outlines of, of clothing that they were wearing, things like that. So um, a, a fascinating, um, uh, you know, memory that we have here of, of sort of a moment frozen in time. Um, another thing to note is that we see a lot of them um, sort of curled up in like the fetal position. Um, and people thought for a long time that maybe that was uh, them trying to protect themselves. The, the, the science now is um, thinking that uh, in the way that the pyroclastic flow hits, it, it hits so quickly that you don't really have time to react. And so what happens is though, is that your muscles uh, involuntarily co contract. And so that's what we're seeing here. Um, so people thought for a long time, you know, would kind of uh, be like, oh, they were trying to, to protect themselves in their last moments. There was lots of talk like that. Um, it was probably actually an involuntary uh, muscle contraction that we see there. So uh, lots to learn from, from Pompeii, not just in the archaeology side, not just on the art side, not even about the Roman world, uh, but also about just science and the human body. Um, so um, a very important site for many reasons. Um, and that, that picture that you see in the bottom left greets you right as you as you enter the site in Pompeii. So if you go there today as a as a tourist, um, it's it's sort of outside by the ticket booth even. And I think that's a great reminder because while this is a fascinating city and while it's um, you know fun maybe to learn about <laughs> you know what a Roman city looked like, it's amazingly well preserved and there's lots of kind of funny things that we see there. Um, it is marked by this this tragedy that happened that came to a very tragic end. So uh, that reminder uh, that you see throughout the site is kind of important to remember that there, there were real people who were living here who unfortunately met a tragic end. Um, but we are going to look at the um, art and archeology span uh, primarily. One thing I did wanna mention that's right is that um, if you see here on the map, so there is Pompeii, across on the other side of Vesuvius is Herculaneum. And Herculaneum was another city, um, a smaller city, a much smaller population, I think only about, uh, do I have it here? Uh, 5,000, so 5,000 people compared to the 20,000 at Pompeii. But it was another um, kind of vacation town, right? Um, and it was hit differently by the pyroclastic flow because it was on the other side of Vesuvius. And so we actually do find a lot of skeletons from Herculaneum. So if you see skeletons at, uh, you know, that are associated with Pompeii, they might actually be from Herculaneum because um, they were much more well-preserved there. This is one example that they found in a boathouse right on the water. Um, about 300 skeletons, I, I believe. Yeah, uh, 300 people. Um, and a lot of them had valuables, uh, like rings, jewelry, things like that. And so um, the fact they were in a boathouse means that they were probably trying to escape um, when the, the pyroclastic flow hit and were unable to make it out. Um, but super well preserved. And we'll talk a little bit more about Herculaneum um, because it has a lot of, uh, other things that are well preserved, like the second stories of, of buildings, which we don't see at Pompeii um, because of the different way that the ash fell and um, was more destructive at Pompeii and actually a little bit well preserved, uh, more well preserved at Herculaneum, even though you, you don't hear about it, it's not as famous as Pompeii, um, but we'll kind of get back to that uh, probably on Thursday. So let's turn to Pompeii. So we're going to start with the city layout. Um, and something to note is that a lot of what I talk about for Pompeii holds true for a lot of Roman cities. So I just want to um, reiterate that, um, that this is, this is a, a, a good example in most respects, not all respects, but in most respects of what a Roman town would look like. Um, something important to note right off the bat is that it's on the grid system. So you can see that there are roughly parallel streets um, with perpendicular streets, um, you know, alongside them. Um, we see a complex system of roads. So there are two uh, main roads uh, in a Roman city called the Decumanus and the Cardo. So the Decumanus runs uh, east to west um, and it's right there. That would be the Decumanus. 
and then the Cardo runs north south and that one's right there. Um, so these are the, those are the two main roads that you'll see in any Roman city and they often um, uh, are ones that start even outside so they connect to a gate. Um, so that's what you see here, right? These gates that they connect to that would lead you in and out of the city. They're sort of the main highways and then they also often meet up around the forum. So um, if you follow the Decumanus even from a different city, if you keep following all the way, um, you'll make it to the forum. And um, when I was uh, excavating in, uh, in Italy, when I was on a dig there, um, that is exactly what I saw. I remember at our town um, near, it was actually kind of close by to Pompeii, but the, the, it's interesting because there's like a really long road and it'll start where there's nothing. And then if you keep following it, it literally goes to like the center of the forum. Um, here, we don't exactly see that. So the forum is about right here, but you can see that it's still on the Decumanus. It's just, you'd have to kind of uh, take a little bit of a detour to the Cardo. But if you follow the Decumanus or the Cardo, you'll probably get into the, the forum eventually. <laughs> um, a couple of other things to note is that there is a hefty city wall. So we have this circuit wall that uh, runs all the way around the city, similar to the Servian wall that we see in Rome, right? Uh, very important for defense. And then we have it marked by these gates um, that are a way to kind of control entry into the city. Um, yeah, so we'll talk about, uh, uh, I'll come back to this again, but important to know, yeah, so the forum area, like I said, is down here. Uh, you might notice the amphitheater right off the bat. We have some theaters here. Um, and then a lot of other th things here would be houses, shops, uh, just sort of, sort of private residences and things. Um, so here is that circuit wall. Um, you can see it here. So this is uh, we're standing on a hill kind of right outside the city. Um, and so Vesuvius is behind us and we're looking southwest and you can see um, how Pompeii really is on the water, right? You can see the bay out there. Um, and then here is the wall here and you can see that it is marked by these towers also, another good defensive feature. Um, and then it would have had um, a gate. I don't know exactly if it would have been right here where the modern day one entrance is. Um, but yeah, it would have been marked by these gates to, to control entry. I showed this picture, but didn't mention it on the other slide. Um, but we actually see evidence from the social war on the circuit wall. So these round holes that you see are actually um, like ballista holes. So, you know, from from the Romans <laughs> trying to get into the city. Um, and that was, I guess, never repaired even from what was that 80 BC or something. So um, never repaired. And so you can see it even today. Um, also the roads. So uh, I talked about the Cardo and the Decumanus, but there was a, a wide, uh, you know, array of roads, a, a network of roads that we see in the city. Uh, the roads were generally stone or, or cobblestone, um, about four and a half meters wide, and they would have these stepping stones. <laughs> and these are really important because uh, the sewage system was not underground or uh, very well managed as it is today, um, but the waste would generally flow through the streets. And so those stepping stones are really important because um, you can see them here. Those are the ones I'm talking about um, in this giant one. They're really important because if you want to cross from one side of the street to the other, you don't want to have to walk through a bunch of waste. So what you're going to do is you're going to step on these stepping stones across, kind of like if you're on a hike and you're, you know, walking across a river, you might hop from rock to rock. Uh, this is the same, the same concept. Um, uh, also, something cool that we can see at Pompeii is uh, we see, and actually you see this a lot, but um, these kind of wheel ruts. So if you'll see, there are these indentations in the road, and that would have been from wagons passing through over and over again on the same route. They would eventually form these ruts. And so um, kind of cool to see the way that traffic would have worked. Um, and there was a book that came out recently that was entirely on the traffic systems of Pompeii. So if you're interested in um, learning more about just how traffic worked in Pompeii, there's a whole book on it. Um, and that's something you'll find about Pompeii is that like there's a book on everything. <laughs> so uh, those are the roads. All right, so um, we're gonna turn now to the forum. So uh, while we do this, I want you to kind of think back and think about the Roman forum, right? What are some things that we see there um, and see if there's any similarities or differences while we look at Pompeii's forum. Um, so here it is. This is a plan of the whole forum. Um, the entrance would have been over here through a triumphal arch. Um, I believe there is another entrance sort of here. There's a couple ones, but the main one was through this triumphal arch um, and you'd enter there. And then here is a temple of Jupiter. 
right? Uh, something that we see sort of in the center of Rome, uh, on the Capitoline Hill. And when the uh, Romans uh, really take over Pompeii in, in around 80 uh, BC, make them citizens and everything, um, it turns into uh, a Capitoline, uh, uh, a triad uh, temple. So we see it divided into uh, worship for Jupiter, for Minerva, and um, uh, Juno. So that is the Temple of Jupiter, uh, a dominating structure in the Forum. And then you have this wide rectangular area where shops would have uh, stood and stalls, you know, people selling things. Um, so that's kind of the commercial side. Alongside that is also um, the Mechelum, which is, I just saw it and then I just lost it. Here we go. <laughs> um, so the McCullum, we'll look at that a little bit uh, closer, but it is a food market. So there are people with their stalls and their shops selling things, but then we have a specific food market um, uh, that's, a, that's a more uh, formal structure for that. Um, so that's off to the side there. Um, what else? Uh, we have some administrative structures, so things that were run by the government. Um, here you see the, uh, the comitum is here, and then we have some municipal offices here, um, uh, and then the basilica here. Anything else I want to talk about before I get to that? No. Okay, so we'll go to the basilica. Okay, so here's a basilica. Um, I was trying to remember if we've talked about a basilica in depth before. I think I've mentioned what it is, but we haven't really talked about the form of one specifically. So to jog your memory, a uh, basilica is um, an administrative building, sort of uh, a main uh, law court. Uh, so you might go there to settle matters of law, judicial issues, um, and any other kind of administrative tasks that might need to get done. So um, kind, of, kind of a city hall type, type building. They were generally rectangular, um, and then they would have some sort of uh, a, a shape at the end. A lot of times it's an apt, apse, so it's a rounded end. We don't see that here, but we do see um, a structure at the end. Um, and that, what you're seeing at the end there is actually uh, this area. And this was called the tribunal. So the tribunal was where the judge would sit, and that is where he would hear cases. So you might wait in the rectangular area for your your case to be heard. And then when it was your time, turn, you would come up to the tribunal and you would talk to the judge and he would decide. Um, a couple of other things is that there would have been uh, niches for statues. There would have been a main statue um, on this little pedestal right here, which we actually still have today that you can see right there. Um, it was, uh, there was a mix of orders that we see here. So alongside the sides of the building on the interior, we see engaged ionic columns. And I should have put a picture of them. You can't really see here. Um, but that's what these uh, kind of half dots are, are engaged ionic columns. And then on the tribunal itself, we see the Corinthian order. So it's ionic along the sides and then Corinthian. And you see that it would have had actually two levels. So there would have been this, this uh, kind of Claire story um, going around the edge, which is like a, a, a level of windows in a way, it's this upper level. Um, and so uh, it would have been two levels there, Corinthian order on both. Um, anything else? Yeah, that's right. So something to, to note about the Basilica, which is kind of interesting um, and perhaps uh, points to the fact that these are all public areas, that they are planned by the government is that the shape of a basilica actually kind of mimics the shape of a forum. And we see that they are both very rectangular and there is a singular axis, which we also see in temples, which we'll see in houses on Thursday. Um, there is this singular frontal axis that you start at one end and you make your way toward the other. And a lot of times that, that back end is marked by, by something um, important, you know, whether it be a statue, um, if you're in the forum, you know, we might have a giant temple at the end, right? Um, even if you're, you're entering from here, but still that sort of idea of a one important end, sort of a, a, a focal point, right? Um, and so that's what we also see in the Basilica with the tribunal here at the end, you enter here and it's a very linear rectangular axis um, with a point of interest at the end. Uh, something else is uh, that we talked about last time, so this is just kind of to refresh your memory and, and situate you now that you have seen the plan of Pompeii, uh, the building of Eumachia, so uh, that was also in the forum, so here's our little forum plan, and that is the one here, it kind of looks like a basilica, remember I mentioned that, and it actually almost looks more like a traditional basilica than the basilica does, because it has that apse, and that you'll see that in almost 
every basilica. And so um, perhaps it was a, a, well, it was a later building than the basilica. And so we might see that addition of the apse that we'll then see moving forward. Uh, the building of Eumachia, yeah, so just to uh, jog your memory, um, it was associated with this woman who was associated with the cult of Augustus in Pompeii, um, and we actually don't know what the building was for, so um, I, I don't want you to get the impression that it was an area of worship, um, even though it was associated with this cult, we don't really, uh, there's no evidence for that, we don't really know what it was. It was put up by the Fuller's Guild, um, which we think maybe uh, Eumachia had, had helped finance or something. And so in gratitude, they had put this building up for her and then used it for their own purposes. Uh, we don't really know, but um, important to note that it is uh, similar in shape to a basilica. Um, and we see a lot of statues there and it was right in the middle of the forum. So likely held some kind of importance, even if we don't know exactly what it was for. Uh, the temples that we see, right, so I mentioned the Temple of Jupiter, um, you can see some remains of it today, uh, you see those, those, that big staircase leading up to the podium, um, and then you see we have a couple temple, or a couple columns left, um, and then you can kind of see there's a uh, triumphal arch that would have been there, and then another one that would have been kind of like here, uh, which we can see there. So there's a lot of really cool reconstructions, um, I'll share a couple on the course webpage because they are some, there's some really cool ones that look like your like in virtual reality, you know, and they're like you're walking through the city, um, all reconstructed as it would have looked in the Roman period. So I'll I'll share those because they're they're pretty cool. Um, so this is one of those reconstructions, and then there was also a Temple of Apollo. Um, if I go back, oops, too far. Um, that is this building here. So that it's a pretty uh, a pretty good sized temple that also predates the Romans. Um, as we know that other cultures like the Etruscans, right, they worshiped Apollo. He was uh, kind of a common god to a lot of people. And so that um, is a pretty old structure. Yeah, 120, but I, it might be older than that. Um, I don't remember if that's a renovation date um, or not, but either way, obviously before the Romans um, in 80 BC, right? And then the Mackellum, so I mentioned that that's like a food market, a more formal food market, a more permanent one than just stalls would have been that popped up in the forum day to day. And so you can see it's mostly an open structure, um, but it would have had this circular structure in the middle. And when archaeologists first excavated it, um, they thought maybe it was a tholos, right? Because it's circular, it has columns, look like it looks like maybe it could be for worship. Uh, but when they started excavating lower, they found a drainage trench and it was filled with uh, evidence of, of fish like parts, fish guts, and <laughs> kinds of things associated with uh, selling or gutting fish. Uh, again, Pompeii on the coast, right? So a lot of evidence of fish here. Um, and so we think that that central structure was not a tholos, not used for worship, um, but actually just would have been a place where people gutted fish and sold fish. Um, so, <laughs> you know, there's there's a joke that kind of everything that archaeologists find, they're always like, oh, it had ritualistic purposes, right? Um, not the case. Sometimes it's just a, a secular, normal structure, you know, in this case uh, for selling fish. And then there would have been all along, uh, alongside the walls shops as well. Um, so that is the McKellum. Something cool to note about it, though, and this is mentioned in your textbook, uh, the wall paintings that are left. So there is uh, some pres preservation of wall paintings here, one of which we see in the upper left there. Um, and this is kind of an interesting one. I know we haven't talked about wall painting, and we'll talk about it a lot more on Thursday. Um, but since while we're talking about this, um, a lot of public art that we see is often uh, has like some kind of moralizing message. So there's when it's intended for a public audience, there's often some kind of message that maybe the government or whoever is putting it up uh, wants the general population to walk away with, you know, to, to take that message. Um, and so what we see here is uh, uh, we see Odysseus and his wife Penelope in one panel, and then we see uh, Zeus and um, his punished lover Eo and then her guardian Argus um, in another panel. And so the fact that we have um, in one Odysseus and Penelope, who is a character of myth, a very loyal wife, that is sort of um, her biggest thing is that she waited for Odysseus as he was gone for all these years, fighting in the war and then trying to make his way back. Um, she waited for him and she didn't remarry, right? So she's a very loyal wife. Um, but Io we see as being punished um, for uh, essentially her disloyalty. So um, we, uh, 
the there's sort of the positive and negative female roles here again maybe a a moralizing message right for for women especially uh for their their place in society remember that being uh, loyal is is rewarded um whereas being disloyal is is punished um, so perhaps a message to these women who maybe would have been shopping at the McKellum, um, sort of uh, religious uh, mythic uh, um, uh, themes to, to take away, right, and to be reminded of. Um, uh, we also see a lot of still life paintings on this wall painting of food items, which makes sense if we're at a food market, perhaps they're showing on the walls things that you can buy. We see a lot of that in Pompeii, um, paintings that have very close relation to the shop or whatever building uh, they're in. So that's going to do it for the forum. Um, I want to move now to the uh, kind of lower part of the city, right? So if we were right here with the forum, we're going not too far away um, to the theater district. So we um, are seeing evidence of entertainment in, in Pompeii, right? Um, we saw theater in, in Rome, the theater of Pompeii, <laughs> not to be confused with the theaters at Pompeii. Um, and so we're gonna look at those a little closer. So there's two of them. The first one is called the large theater uh, because it is bigger than the other one. So that makes it the large theater. theater. <laughs> um, it's from around the second century BC, um, but it was renovated after the earthquake in 62. So we see a lot of um, you know, first century construction uh, we see again that skinny fronds, right? Like we see in the theater of Pompey, there would have been this kind of um, decoration, this this backdrop for the for the stage. Um, we see the the cavia, uh, an orchestra area, right? Um, the seats uh, that are in the very traditional Greek. Um, uh, uh, shape, I suppose. Um, the seats would have been separated by hierarchy of people. So uh, the wealth, wealthiest aristocrats would have sat closest to the stage at the bottom and the, the people who are lower in society would have sat at the top. <laughs> um, not too different today if you look at ticket prices, right? <laughs> um, but this would have been mainly for plays. Um, so performances like that. And then what we see also um, is the not the small theater. You would think it would be called the small theater. And I won't ding you if you call it the small theater, but it's called the Odeon. Um, Odeon literally means singing place. Um, and it is smaller if you look at it, right? So here's the large theater and then here's the Odeon. Um, the Odeon likely would have been roofed and it is more for musical performances and um, oration. So like speaking uh, speeches. Um, and that is mainly thought that because um, musical instruments and things might not have reached far enough in the large theater to be able to hear it at the back but if they made a smaller theater and then they roofed it like the acoustics would be better so you could hear um, music better and so music was done here and then plays where they're just speaking performances you know would have been done in the large theater um, but we see a similar sort of thing right where we have this backdrop and then again the seats would have been separated into like a hierarchy um, we also see at the back here, uh, these would have been gladiator barracks. So um, gladiators, we'll talk about in a second, but um, that was, uh, they were housed by the city, um, kind of like contract contracted athletes in a way. And so we see there um, some barracks uh, behind the theater here. But the gladiators would not have performed at the theaters, they would have performed in the amphitheater. So if we are here, uh, that was the theater district, right? We're gonna go this way to the other side of the city, um, to the amphitheater. And if you go today, that's one of the first things that you'll see when you walk in, the entrance is very close to the amphitheater. Uh, I talked about this, I think on maybe like the very first lecture. Uh, very important to know though, between the theater and the amphitheater. Um, so today, if you were to go to an amphitheater, you would likely go to some kind of outdoor half circle theater, right? Where you'd maybe watch uh, a concert or a play. I have like an outdoor one near my house here, you know, in Southern California, we, uh, it's like an outdoor play theater. That's an amphitheater now. Back in the Roman times, not the same thing. <laughs> so what we would call an arena or a stadium, think of where sports teams play, that is an amphitheater. And a, a, a way to remember this um, is that ampha, that, that prefix means both or double. It has like the, the idea of combining two things. So you're combining two theaters to make an amphitheater, right? And so it's a full circle and then you have one theater and another theater together to make the amphitheater. So uh, amphitheater also Colosseum, a big one, <laughs> you know, that's pretty much uh, Colosseum 
blue, like that means like a giant thing. Colossus means like giant. Um, and so the, the implication there is, is a, it's like the biggest amphitheater. But uh, Pompeii had a modest sized one, as you can see. Uh, circular, it too would have had seats separated by hierarchy and it would have had kind of a complex archway system. And so um, when you walk through the arches there, uh, you would be directed toward your seat. Um, so there are staircases and arches that lead to the seating areas, as you can see. Um, so you see like the arches that come out around the top and then you see arches that come uh, around the bottom, right? And then this is where the gladiators or whatever is happening in the, the uh, competition, uh, they would come out of these uh, lower archways. Um, and then we also see those archways extending to the outside, right? So you would enter, uh, you know, if you have a, if you know where your seat is going to be, then you would enter through the archways. Um, we also see a great depiction of the amphitheater at Pompeii on a fresco um, in a house nearby. And um, we know that from a literary source that in 59 CE, there was a massive riot between rival groups of gladiators, essentially. So a riot broke out after a uh, gladiator competition between the Nusarians and the Pompeians. So uh, Nusarians were a, like a local, a rival town, basically. Um, and we see that riot depicted here. So we see people fighting inside the amphitheater. And then we see people fighting in the streets, right? If you think of like British soccer, right? <laughs> you know, the passion that people get after sporting events, uh, perhaps unsurprising that this one dissolved into a riot also. Um, there was actually a penalty for this. So we know that there, uh, the, the punishment for this riot that happened was that the Pompeians were not allowed to hold any gladiator fights for 10 years. Um, so between 59 CE and 69 CE, there were no more gladiator fights because of this riot that they had caused. Um, gladiator fights wouldn't have been the only thing that we would see in an amphitheater. Um, we might also see beast hunts. So they would bring in uh, animals, oftentimes exotic animals from faraway places um, and pit them against uh, a person or pit them against each other. Um, and we would also see the execution of criminals here. So there were some uh, judicial moments, I suppose, um, that would punctuate the entertainment, um, which may also some people have interpreted as entertainment um, to watch people be executed. Not a, uh, uh, you know, it was a pretty gory time, right? Um, and that was a, a sort of a full day of events that you would have where you would see these beast hunts, you would see someone get executed, and then you would see gladiator fights at the end of the day. Um, so that is a common day of entertainment for uh, people in the Roman Empire. Uh, we're going to move now to another a uh, big thing that you'll see in lots of Roman towns, and that is baths. So baths are not necessarily um, how we think of them today. They're think they're kind of a combination of uh, baths in, in the sense of cleansing yourself, um, but also gyms. So people would work out at baths um, and also social gatherings. So if you imagine like a bunch of old men sitting around in a sauna like they used to do, right? Um, that's sort of the same idea that you would go to the baths and you would hang out, you would see people, you would socialize, you would gossip, all of these things. Um, the baths were open to everyone. So the men and women were separated, but they were open to all social classes. So um, you can see how that really would have um, led to lots of social interaction um, if it's a place that just everyone goes, right? Um, so this is one of the best preserved that we have. Um, uh, it's uh, in Pompeii, it is in Pompeii, and there are other baths in Pompeii, but this is sort of the best and the most interesting one. So we'll be looking at this one. They're called the Stabian baths. Uh, you see it right here, Stabian baths. And um, if we, uh, we're, we're kind of going to walk through it. So you'll enter here and you can go there today. So you can, you'll enter here and then you'll see this wide open area and that is called a palestra. Um, I'll get back to that in a second. So um, the palestra would be this open area out in front and it's sort of a, a wrestling or an outdoor exercise practice area, um, kind of like a field, right? That people might do different things. Um, and then you see this colonnade that goes along and that's where you would enter. Um, I did want to show that's right. This, <laughs> um, this is actually from a, a kid's book, but sometimes kids books about like history have great illustrations and look at it, it's colorful, it's fun. It's great. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so that's not on the map, but say we were just from 
uh, we are in the palestra and we're going to enter the baths. We'll enter here and then we'll go through all these different rooms. So uh, the first one that you'll go to, again, same thing. Here's the, the colonnade, here's the palestra. Um, you're gonna enter over here. And so that we're going to go is the uh, entrance hall and then you'll come into the uh, potitarium, which is the undressing room, like a changing room or a locker room, right? Something else that we see at gyms. Um, but you'll notice that it's very lavishly decorated. So again, this was a, kind of a social event. Um, it was a thing to do. It wasn't a chore. It was a. It was almost, a, you know, an enjoyable activity kind of. So they really make this bath um, very luxurious, um, which is also kind of cool because it was open to people of all social classes. Um, so people from lower social classes could have experienced a nice bath. Um, so here's the, the changing room. You can see it in the back here, actual kind of like lockers almost. They're these little niches where people could have put their clothing. And then from there, um, so that's what this is here, right? You can see that lavish decoration that they're trying to replicate. And then off to the side, we're going to go to that chamber, which is the frigidarium. So there are three main uh, rooms or components of bathhouses in the Roman world. And the first is the frigidarium, and that means the cold room. So they're all heated to different temperatures. The first one is the frigidarium, the cold room. And you can see that it would have had like a basin of, of water, um, and then there would have been these niches that held statues. Um, so again, it would have been really opulent, uh, a very nice place. It's not a dingy shower. It's actually a, a quite enjoyable um, experience. Here is a a reconstruction that we can see of what the the paintings might have looked or at like. Um, we see a lot of like underwater type imagery or or you know related to water, which makes sense for in a bathhouse. Um, and then we can see some evidence of of stars um, that likely would have been on the roof. And so we have this uh, sort of circular structure and then stars above. So you almost feel like you're outside. There's a lot of of natural motifs um, and then a starry sky above you. Uh, next, you would go into the tepidarium. So that is the warm room. That's kind of a, a sort of a room temperature, but maybe a little bit warm. Um, tepidarium, if you think of um, like tepid water, right? It's kind of like room temperature water. And then frigidarium is like a refrigerator, cold, frigid. Um, so the tepidarium um, also would have been lavishly decorated. So we see um, these really cool, uh, almost like the caryatids, right? They're similar to that. Um, not quite, because we do see columns behind them as well. Um, they also kind of look like uh, Atlas, who was a, a mythological figure who held up the world um, on his shoulders. Uh, but so similar kind of references to other things that we've seen. Um, but yes, these men, uh, very uh, idealized body types, right? So we see intense musculature here, um, uh, which also might make sense if you're in a gym. Maybe you want to get some inspiration, right, from from people who look really good. Uh, you know, you want that body type, so you're gonna go back out to the courtyard and do some more push-ups. Um, other things that we see, uh, we see almost like uh, similar to um, Temple of Vesta in Tivoli, those coffers. These aren't quite coffers because I don't think they actually have depth to them, but similar thing where we have these square panels that are more interesting and look like they have more depth than just a flat surface. Um, so we have uh, these squares here with kind of circular decorations as we saw in the coffers, although these are not actual coffers, but they're kind of painted to look that way. Um, we also do see uh, lots of sort of scrolling decoration. Um, I also said, you know, there's more um, vegetal decoration as well. Um, and then we have uh, uh, this um, opening here, which would have let light in. And then lastly, we have the Caledarium. So that is the hot room. Um, and this is a third one that you would have come to. Also really cool, this barrel vault that comes up above you, right? So um, this is a great example of one. Um, uh, lots of curved spaces that we see in these baths. And this one would have terminated in an apse that you see, that rounded end, that apse, um, where there's a basin of water. And then we see this oculus. Um, so that's a, that's a circular hole in the ceiling that would have let light through, called an oculus. Um, and it kind of just creates a dramatic atmosphere, right? So um, just again, the idea of experience, how we talked about that, um, was it Praeneste that we talked about that? I think so. Um, but the idea of experience in architecture, and that's something I'm really interested in because that's kind of what I study, um, but how spaces are built to create a certain experience and 
um, the thought behind that, right, that we are having these spaces of light and dark, um, these interesting shapes. So we have some buildings like a basilica that are very rectangular, but then we also have baths, which are much more curved and have, you know, the, the walls are curved and also the ceiling is curved. Um, and the way that you make your way through this bathhouse, so you start outdoors, you go through that entrance hall, that changing room, and then you go to the frigidarium and then the tepidarium and the calidarium. You're going through all of these spaces and you're being led on this experience, essentially. Um, it's just really interesting and, and um, sort of speaks to, to a complexity in the architecture um, that they didn't have to do that. They could have just made three rooms or three buildings and be done with it, but instead they're kind of taking you on this journey. Uh, the rooms, especially the, the caladarium and the tepidarium, would have been heated by something called a hypocaust. So this was, uh, we'll see this a lot in Roman, in the Roman world, um, and even beyond, you see it afterwards in the medieval period too, but it was a system of heating. So if you have a hot room and you don't have electricity, how are you going to make it hot? <laughs> and so what they would do is they would have a furnace area. So they would start a fire, they'd have a furnace going, and um, especially in public buildings, you'll see this because you would need someone to tend it all day. And so if you just have a house, if you're just kind of like a middle class person with a house, you don't have someone tending that furnace all day. But if you're at a public building, you can have someone do that. So the furnace um, would be there and then it would push the hot air into this um, underground chamber. And that's where you see these, um, these sort of pillars of tile Tile, flat rectangular tile brick. Um, so those are ceramic. You'll see all of these coming up. And um, what they do is they force the air also into the walls and to the uh, floor above you. And so they that also forces the air upwards and it heats the room above you. Um, and there's even something that like, it was recommended that you wore sandals in the bathhouse because the floor might be hot because that's where the heater is. You're essentially walking on the heater. Um, but that's how it would have, um, heated the room and also heated the water, right, in the um, caladarium and things. Um, oh, actually, you know what, I'll show you that on this, I just forgot. We love that kid's picture. I know, I'm gonna go all the way back because it's so cool. Um, yeah, so you can kind of see, right, the, the pools would have been um, warmed by this underfloor heating and there's kind of the furnace area and then it would have forced it into these um, hypocausts here. And the heat would flow behind the wall tiles and go up. Um, so once again, that experience, right, here's the entrance hall, you have the frigidarium here, and then you go out into the uh, tepidarium, and then the caladarium with that apse um, and the barrel vaulted ceiling. And then the women's um, gym would be over here, so it would be separate from the men's. I gotta go all the way back. Okay, <laughs> um, so how would the water get to these bathhouses? Uh, the Romans were famous for their use of aqueducts. We don't actually have a lot of aqueducts um, like you see in the upper image right here. Um, we don't have a lot of those left from Pompeii, but we do have them from other parts of the Roman world, especially in places like France. Um, and you can see how aqueducts would have worked so that would have taken water um, from a reservoir or an ocean or whatever, a natural body of water. Um, and then uh, they would have had it move through toward the city. And so it's all gravity, essentially. Um, the, the way that these aqueducts work um, is that the, the properties of water mean that it will it will flow in, in one direction, right? Um, and so that's how these, these essentially, they're just bridges work. Um, but they would lead into the city. And the way that they would do that is they would narrow into these chambers um, that would be built in the city. And then they would flow into these kind of reservoirs that were built there. <laughs> so I just had to share this because when I was at Pompeii, um, we went into a Roman aqueduct. <laughs> and it's, it's kind of a funny story. So I was there with um, people that I was on an archaeological dig with and our tour guide was showing us around. and. Um, we came up to this and he was like, oh yeah, like some people go inside the Roman, you know, the aqueduct. Um, and we were like, well, can we do it? And he was like, I mean, yeah, like, okay, just like be quick about it if you can fit. So <laughs> I was the first one and I climbed through this little hole and it's really cool because you're like inside this kind of chamber that would have been filled with water. And then you see this just super long tum tunnel that looks like it goes on forever because that's where the water would have come from. Um, and so you can see really far into that. And it's actually interesting because you can see some graffiti also or like wall paintings. So even in the Roman times, people also would have been in these aqueducts. So 
So it was really cool. We get out and we meet up with the other half of our, our group for lunch. <laughs> and we're telling them like, we went in this aqueduct. It was so cool. And they're like, oh my gosh, like we haven't been over there yet. We got to do that. And I'm like, oh yeah, you got to do it. It's really cool. And so then they do it. <laughs> And then at the end of the day, they're telling us, and they're like, yeah, thanks for telling us we can go on the aqueduct because uh, the Italian authorities came up and yelled at us and like forced us to get out because apparently you're not supposed to go inside the aqueduct. So we felt a little bad then, but we didn't get yelled at, they did. So if you are in Pompeii, maybe don't go in the aqueduct, but maybe later you can, I don't know, just at your own risk. Anyway, all right, aqueducts. Um, next up is uh, shops. So. This is the last thing we'll look at um, when it comes to urban layout, uh, but the shop system. So I mentioned it a little bit before um, because we were talking about the forum with the, the shops and the stalls. And then I talked about the McKellum, which was more of a formal food market. Um, but that's where you would have gone to buy food like or to buy uh, like food ingredients, right? Um, so you're buying your fish for your family or whatever it might be. Shops would have had ready-made food. So uh, similar to now, you know, they were kind of like fast food restaurants in a way, and they employed this, this counter system. So uh, they were set right on the street. So you can see the street here, and there's sort of a sidewalk, and then the counter is right there. They would have had this, this opening, um, and the counter is right there. So uh, it really is a, a fast food takeaway uh, restaurant, essentially. Um, and you see these um, openings in the counter that would have held uh, like deep urns kind of uh, pottery um, vessels that would have had the, the food in it and it would have kept the food warm. So um, a lot of times, you know, you would get a hot meal here and then it would be in those, um, those containers. They also would have had some seating. Um, so you could sit there and enjoy a meal, kind of like a tavern. Um, and then a lot of times in Pompeii, we can tell what the shop was actually serving. So we can tell what kind of food was there um, by the, well, a couple things. First of all, the archaeological evidence of um, like organic remains. So in the McKellum, right, we saw uh, that archaeologists were actually able to find like fish, fish parts um, and evidence of fish in the soil and things like that. Um, so you can see organic parts, but you can also see elements of construction that point to um, what these shops were. So in this case, we have a bakery oven. Right, so that's what this is here. Um, and it's actually kind of uh, behind the shop a little bit, but it would have been a place where bread was baked um, and that's still intact. And so we know that the shop that is in front of it likely was a bakery, it sold bread because it has a bread oven. Um, and in some cases we actually have food from Pompeii that was preserved. So this is perhaps the most famous loaf of bread in the world, <laughs> um, but it is a, a fully preserved loaf of Roman bread. Um, and it is in a museum now, but it, that is exactly how it would have looked. So it would have been a round loaf and then it would have been uh, divided into these sections. Um, and we see that in other cases too, that we have actual evidence of um, real food that remains. Um, and I don't know if anyone has tried to look at it and see what it tastes like yet, but maybe someday. <laughs> uh, and another thing to note about Palm Bay is that Discoveries are being made literally every day there. So excavation continues. Um, you can follow the Instagram account. That's what I do. And they always post about the new discoveries that they have uh, came up with. And so this one was literally from last month, December, 2020. They found a, uh, a new shop. They excavated it and they found these amazing wall paintings, these super brightly colored paintings um, that were just uncovered. And you can, you know, you can see that they still have to get all a little bit off right there. Um, a lot of interesting stuff that we see in the subject matter. Um, and in case, this case, like I said, where um, in the McKellum you saw there were some uh, like still lifes of food. We see the similar thing here, right? So they might have sold poultry at this shop. Um, this, these could have mimicked something that was maybe hanging behind the bar. Um, we also see this, uh, this dog um, and there is an inscription, an obscene inscription that, that goes with it. Um, and people were, have been debating about who the inscription is aimed at. Is it aimed at the dog? Is it aimed at the owner of the shop uh, comparing him to a dog? But um, there is that. And we see a lot of that in Pompeii, a lot of obscene uh, graffiti, um, people, things that people have scratched on walls, um, things like that. Um, and then also along the side, we see some scenes from myth. And this one is also interesting. Um, it's kind of like a miniaturized version of the shop in a way. So um, lots of wall paintings that connect to what we have in front of us. 
Uh, shops also bore a close relationship with homes. So there was no zoning laws in Pompeii. There wasn't a uh, separation where you would have like a neighborhood here and then you would have the uh, shopping district over here, like shopping centers like we have now. It was all intermixed. Um, and what would happen is, is that in homes, they would often lease out their front two rooms to shops, to shop owners. So the shops would be in the front and then the house would extend in the back. And this is actually where I am going to leave it today because uh, next time we will be talking about homes. So we'll, uh, this is a good, a good bridge between the two, right? Um, the fact that we actually do see some shops in homes um, and we'll be looking next time at home layout, similar to how we looked at city layout today. And then we'll also be looking at decoration, uh, which is really exciting. Um, uh, lecture and a lot of interesting stuff, a lot of <laughs> very interesting wall paintings uh, that we'll see at, at Pompeii. Uh, lots of uh, obscene remarks and obscene drawings. So uh, stay tuned for that and I'll see you next time.